talk to you about what uh, about GPU computing and where it came from, and you know why why is it that your uh, that your graphics card, your VGA controller, show, shows up in the supercomputer. The main driving motivation behind all of this is is uh, is power, uh, power, uh, getting more performance per watt and more performance per uh, per dollar is is driving uh, the the push towards leveraging commodity markets such as such as graphics. So if we plot out these lines, we're looking at a exaflop computer in about 2018 and hopefully 2019, depending on how you how you round it off. But where we're at is um, the, the big problem is that this exponential increase in performance has come at the cost of an exponential increase in power. And so from a 200 kilowatt machine uh, of the, the CM5, which, uh, uh, which was l big and loud, but it only used 200 kilowatts, and whereas the Titan supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab is, is uh, over 8 megawatts. And so, they, so those, that number one machine has not been at constant power. Now the good news is there have been perf uh, there's been progress in performance per watt, but it's, but it's not sustaining that, uh, that growth. Here's the, the bad news, and this is kind of um, you know, VLSI in a uh, completely o oversimplified. You know, you've all heard of, Moore's, of Moore's Law, and the, the fundamental principle underneath that is uh, Denard scaling. And basically, what it says is as we double the, the feature size, we're going to get 2x more transistors uh, in, a, in, a, in a fixed amount of area. At the same time, we would all, by making those transistors smaller, we would also make them faster. And we would, re because they were, also because they were smaller, we would reduce the capacitance uh, by, uh, by 0.7x, and we would re simultaneously reduce the voltage. So that triangle, it, you know, so we would eventually get a 2.7x, whatever it is, uh, increase in in performance for a doubling of, 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 the, feet, uh, of the feature size and uh, add a constant power. So, so it's still the same power, uh, but uh, you know, 2.7x faster. And that's the, the law that, that drove Moore, Moore's law, what we know of as Moore's law, and drove that, that number one computer for a long, long time. The bad news is that, uh, that uh, two of those things broke down. We still get 2x more transistors, we still get a reduction in capacitance, but we are not able to reduce the voltage and not able to, to make the transistors faster as the, as the feature size shrinks. So the, um, the results of that is instead of a 2.7x increase in performance at the same power, we get about a 2x performance with a little bit more power, with you know, 20 or 30 percent more power. Both of these graphs are completely oversimplified, but, uh, but it uh, still shows, shows the point. You could also get, if you want to keep the same power, you only get 1.4x improvement in performance. And so this is why uh, performance per watt is such a big deal. As we want more and more performance, we want that growth to continue to go up. We want our phones to be more powerful. We want our laptops to be uh, sleeker than they were last year, and yet, uh, yet perform uh, more functions and and uh, keep up with our uh, our, in, our shrinking attention span, and so uh, that doing so at a constant power or even lower power puts a lot of pressure on the, on these laws. So basically, the the what that resulted in a perf per watt is a 68% growth rate in the. Denard scaling area era that sort of ended uh, roughly four to five years ago, depending on who you ask. And the post-Denard area, it's it's about seven about 19 percent improvement in perf per watt. Now that that uh, number one on the top 500 is actually even more than than 68 percent. It's about uh, 80 some odd percent. And so the difference between those uh, came at um, at uh, at the cost, the difference of those was made up by adding more power to those systems. So the problem is there's, there's no more power, there's no more uh, free transistors, and so we actually have to, to do some work. So the first question we figure out is 
well, where does, where does the power go? Well, we want to do flops, right? We want to do some computation. Hopefully, you're learning that all week. The cost of a 64-bit double precision FMA is about 20 picojoules. So um, it is, and so this is in a in a 28 nanometer, uh, uh, you know, no particular uh, design. But if, if you did, you know, what is the you know a reasonably good uh, floating point multiplier reasonably fast, it would be about 20 picojoules. The problem is that to get the arguments to, to feed that, that multiplier, if you want to read 256 bits to get the arguments to the FMA and, and write out the results, it's going to cost you 50 picojoules. <coughs> and to move the data f um, a few, uh, about one, uh, one or two millimeters on the chip is 26 picojoules, and to move it halfway across the chip is 256 picojoules. So the, as you can see, the, the cost of, oh, and moving it from one corner of the chip to another is going to be 1,000 a, a picojoules. And it gets even worse if you want to move it off of the chip. It's uh, 16 nanojoules or, uh, using uh, DRAM interfaces that we have today. Or if you designed a very special high-speed uh, link, you could get that down to about 500 uh, picojoules. So all of those things um, add up. And, and if you, you can figure out, well, if I want uh, 50 uh, gigaflops per watt, what is my budget? It's about uh, uh, 20 picojoules. 20 picojoules um, gives you the floating point multiply, but it doesn't give you anything else. And so we will get some progress by, by smaller and smaller feature size, but we also have to be smarter. And number one, not move data. And number two, make sure that, that all of the hardware that is there can be used efficiently. So the first thing we, we do is, well, we can stop making it worse. Um, and so that's why simultaneously with the, the, the end of, of that Denard scaling era, uh, everybody started doing multi-core. Prior to that time, you had to spend $10,000 to buy a, 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 a SMP uh, processor. And, and to, to buy a computer with more than one processor in it was a lot of money. It would, it would take you a lot of money to go buy one that only had one. right? You, you can't buy them any, anymore. And so multi-core processors have, have focused instead uh, of making them faster, that they make them wider, more parallelism and more, uh, more power. What we are doing is taking all of the complexity that we threw at single thread performance and instead focus on, on parallel performance. What if you designed a parallel processor from the ground up that didn't have the constraints of a parallel processor? And that's what we mean by, by hybrid computing. Uh, hybrid computing um, is a GPU. A GPU is something that's designed to be a uh, parallel processor, that's its, its main focus in life. If you ran Microsoft Word or any other single-threaded code on it, it would run really, really poorly. And so um, it, uh, uh, they've actually gotten sophisticated enough it might actually run. But it's optimized for throughput instead of for, uh, for the speed of a, of a single thread. And so to make that thing still usable, we actually couple it with a with a high-speed uh, latency-optimized core, or a CPU as we know it today. And, uh, and that's why it's called a, a hybrid processor. There's a, latency -optimized, a set of latency-optimized cores and a set of throughput-optimized cores. And we're not the only, only people thinking that way. That's, that's the way the, the industry is moving. So now I'm going to switch a little bit with that in mind. So you know, this would all make sense if it, you know, if it came to you from a you know, traditional parallel HPC processor company, but why is there a graphics processor company here talking about this? Um, and to do that, I'll give you a very brief history of, of graphics. In the, in the beginning, there was wireframes. And uh, you know, all, all it was about was drawing lines from point, point A to point B. And they had these units in there that, that uh, the, all they would do is transform the vertices so you could rotate it. So it multi, do a matrix multiply on the vertex, figure out the projection of that line on the screen, 
and uh, draw from, from point A to point B. Uh, a cool stop along the way was uh, persistence-based uh, storage tubes that you could actually draw the line once with an analog circuit and the, the line would stay uh, through an analog uh, you know, electron tube. And so that didn't actually require any math. It was all just, just analog. But, uh, but before too long, we uh, evolved it enough that you could afford enough memory to, ha to hold a Z buffer. Uh, and, um, and so now you, you had another step in the graphics pipeline. You needed to add lighting to the vertices, and you needed to fill in those rasterized polygons. And at each one of those pixels, you would compare against the depth, buf depth buffer to see which one was closest and, uh, and shade it and draw highly realistic flight simulated uh, images. And then um, as in the kind of third generation, they added uh, texture mapping. So at each one of those points, it would do an interpolation, a bilinear interpolation of a, of a texture data at, at that point as it was rasterizing the, the image. The architecture sort of evolved along with this. Um, the application would run on the host, and it would send down geometry, rasterization, pixels, and so forth to the device, to the, the graphics processor. And this is what some of those things looked like. The, the geometry engine was one circuit board. The, the uh, frame buffer uh, you know, was probably a whole um, megapixel or so, if that, at four bits per pixel. And you could put two of those next to each other and get eight bits per pixel. And eventually, they, be, they became more and more capable and more and more programmable. So at one point, all of the, uh, at this point, all of the, uh, most of the functionality was fixed function, special purpose, custom built ICs. But people wanted to do more and more things. And so rather than building special purpose hardware for everything under the sun, those devices became more programmable. And so uh, DirectX kind of rode that train. There's a similar line for, uh, for OpenGL. Um, they you know, evolved from no lighting to per vertex lighting and to eventually being able to do lighting per pixel. Um, and the programmability of it was not uh, awesome. You, you, know, you could have you know, sometimes 16, 32 instructions, and so you could you know, figure out what you wanted to do on that pixel with your 32 instruction. Some very dedicated souls in the beginning that coined the term GPGPU decided, well, there's this programmable device. It has a whole lot of floating point horsepower, and it's really efficient. Can I use that to do scientific computing? And so there's a bunch of people that, that, uh, um, that worked on this. There's um, uh, people that did ray tracing, there's people that did uh, PDE solvers, people that did uh, you know, conjugate gradient uh, solvers, uh, people that did um, uh, fast multiple methods, you name it. Somebody tried to figure out how to, how to do this. And the, the problem was it wasn't particularly well suited. So this is, we dug this out of the archive from Ian Buck, uh, that, who's now the the head of the CUDA at NVIDIA. So here's, here's how you do it. Um, and then there's different versions for different graphics cards. Um, then you create some floating point. You turn off, make sure you turn off filtering. Uh, and, uh, and you create the shaders to add things together. And you copy the data. And now you've added two vectors, right? <laughs> so, so his uh, you know, idea at the time was, was Brook. That uh, Brook is, uh, uh, was a research project at, at Stanford. Uh, and uh, eventually, Ian joined uh, NVIDIA and created CUDA and trying to figure out how to make, get, give you the access to that with a, with a, a real programming language. Fast forwarding to, to where it's at today, you know, the first CUDA capable uh, device was introduced in 2006. Uh, it was called the G80. We had a double precision and ECC uh, along the way. And uh, today, the, the architecture that we ship is called Kepler. Kepler is, about, uh, is a single card that has 1.3 teraflops of double precision um, 
you can achieve about 90 some odd percent of that uh, with, with a DGEM. And it's still these. It's still driven by the ability to, to, uh, raster, to transform vertices, rasterize pixels, and, and shade. And so you can, so there is a mass market behind it. So the reason that, that we can sell you a 1.3 teraflop uh, device for a uh, uh, for a thousand dollars, if you can find one on Amazon, that's how much they cost. Uh, the the GeForce Titan, named after the Titan supercomputer, is um, is is because there is a mass market, and that we sell as many of those things as we can make. So the way that it's evolved, we no longer have pagefuls of of code to add two vectors. Um, we actually have a variety of different ways to to program GPUs, uh, libraries, directives, and and CUDA. Or kind of, or programming languages are kind of the big three features. So to just give you a flavor of it, um, if you take this is the the same example that that scrolled by in so many pages before. If you take your simple uh, serial C code that that uh, would add those two vectors, um, you can uh, simply uh, create a function. That, that does the same thing for one individual element in that vector. So one, all it does is, is adds uh, you know, y of i equals ax uh, plus y of i. And then this uh, tri triple chevron, this triple bracket syntax uh, highlighted on the bottom, uses the, essentially the dynamic uh, uh, hardware-based load balancer on the GPU to invoke a single thread on every element of that vector that will go and just like it was a pixel on the screen, it will go and, and, and invoke some work for that, that pixel and launch and, and perform that computation. And sometimes those threads are adding a single point like this, sometimes it's a, uh, sometimes it's a, a whole ray tracing a whole ray, sometimes it's uh, uh, solving a, a single non-zero in a sparse matrix computation. Sometimes it's you know a, a point in a in a stencil for a uh, for those types of of algorithms. And the, so the way that it works, the fundamental unit of computation is a is a thread, and a thread is um, in most ways uh, the same way that you think about a thread on a CPU, except that they're really really lightweight. You can create and destroy billions of them every second. And they are grouped into, um, into sets that are called a, a thread block. Those thread blocks can interact at a fine grain with uh, barriers. And then those thread blocks are grouped together in, into a kernel. And kernels also have an implicit barrier between them. Uh, thread blocks also have a, uh, a small access to a small scratch thread memory that's located on the GPU, and if you remember that that uh, slide at the very beginning that if you want power efficiency, you can't move the data very far. And so this is located uh, right next to the, the floating point units that we can uh, access uh, data and share it at a very fine grain between those threads. And then they also have access to global memory that's, um, that, you know, that, that's shared between the device and has, has very high bandwidth. So the, the G80 architecture that, that, uh, that we produced is, uh, is essentially that model that's mapped to uh, a set of uh, what are called streaming multiprocessors that are each independent uh, uh, units and um, uh, that employ, uh, have, they essentially, there's essentially three modes of parallelism. There's SIMD or SIMT is kind of our variant on uh, SIMD parallelism that's 32 wide. There is um, uh, multi-threading, which uh, hides latency in the memory system, so it'll context switch on every single uh, cycle, and uh, multi-processing among the different multiprocessors. So where are we going with that? Well, we're, trying, we're driving towards three somewhat competing goals. And one is to make it extremely power efficient. Second is to make it uh, easier to program and uh, have the code be more portable across not only our own architectures but others as well and covering the space of applications. And so our latest step in that is, is Kepler. Um, SMX was, is driving the power efficiency 
Hyper-Q and dynamic parallelism are trying to help solve the, the other two problems. It's, uh, it's a 7.1 billion transistor uh, chip. It's uh, one of the largest, um, it is the largest processor-based chip that's ever been built. There are FPGAs and other RAM chips that have more transistors, but as far as a processor goes, it's a, an extremely complicated device. Um, it, uh, every one of these top-end chips that we build, it almost kills us. Um, and it has uh, 15 of those streaming multiprocessors, about 1.3 teraflops of double precision performance, uh, L2 cache of one and a half megabytes, and a 384-bit wide uh, memory interface that, um, to, a, to a high-speed uh, graphics memory. It achieved over 3x the sustained performance per watt over the previous generation. And if you remember correctly, I told you we were only getting 40% or so. Um, we went from 40 nanometer to 28 nanometer. So we only get about 40% for free. And so we had to actually be smart for the other 1.7x. And so the, there's a lot, of, a lot of features that added up to being smart. But one of, it, you know, one of the main reasons is that we, we made even further sacrifices in serial performance in order to give you more parallelism. So the chip is wider and slower. It's, uh, and I expect that, that to continue, along with reducing some of the design overheads and, and other things as well. So one of the other uh, features that, you know, we told you that what graphics wanted was, you know, render, uh, draw this polygon on the screen. And that's the way Fermi worked. You would launch a, a kernel, which was your uh, you know, sparse matvec or something on the GPU. But a lot of, of HPC, and so if you had a lot of those, you'd end up going back and forth, back and forth. But a lot of HPC codes actually have more of a, a nested structure. And so what we added was the capability for a, a GPU to launch work to itself and expose that dynamic load balancer to the, uh, to the GPU itself so you could launch one set of parallel tasks and each one of those could launch a million parallel tasks, and each one of those could launch a million. And of course, if you do that too much, it will, won't work, but, but it actually will chew through uh, several nesting levels of those uh, uh, very, uh, very gracefully. So it, uh, quick sort, uh, you know, when I, you know, we don't expect you to read every line of code, but you should get the idea that the one on the right is smaller than the one on the left, and that uh, it, and, and it was easier to write uh, you know, a quick sort like um, program, and it also improved performance by about a factor of two. You know, there are uh, GPUs in, in uh, Blue Waters, there are GPUs uh, in Titan, which is the, uh, was the number one supercomputer on the planet for, for a few months, but that's the way, they, the way those things go. And it's uh, often running real applications, many of which, if you had told people five or 10 years ago that, that some of these would run on a GPU, they probably would have told you you were crazy. Um, and so the fact that we've been able to get you know, a climate simulation or things like that running on a GPU is because that has evolved to be the parallel processor that it, that it started to become. So where is it going? So as I mentioned, uh, computers are not getting faster. They're just getting wider. And so that poses both a challenge and an opportunity for computational scientists. Um, the, the, and the, it's either good news or bad news, depending on which side of that equation you are. But a lot of applications are not prepared for 4,000-way uh, or 10,000-way parallelism on the node. Uh, a lot of applications are not prepared. Titan, if you fully maxed it out, would have 535 uh, million threads. It has 50 million um, active floating points on every single clock cycle. And if you do, this, do the math, an exaflop computer um, will run at about a gigahertz. I don't think anybody's going to stand up here and claim otherwise. An exaflop computer at a gigahertz implies one billion way parallelism at bare minimum if you don't ha have to hide any latency. And so it's not, and, but the problem is it's not just the applications, it's also the algorithms. You know, what is the preconditioner that can deal with 10,000-way parallelism? That, uh, what is the preconditioner that doesn't need to communicate frequently? What is the, um, you know, what is the, 
the right way to do molecular dynamics in this, in this type of, of regime? What is the right way to do radiation transport? You know, would a Monte Carlo code be more suited uh, to, uh, to this type of, of architecture? So a lot of it's about exposing that parallelism. It's not about you know, whether you're running on a GPU or you're running on something else, but it's about whether you can tackle parallelism in its finest grain. If you just start taking a big problem and dice it up um, into fairly coarse grain chunks, that's a really good way of uh, uh, the MPI got us through you know, the 90s and the 2000s, basically the last 20 years of, of parallel computing. But in order to achieve the next level or parallelism within the chip, we need to be able to, to tackle parallelism at its finest grain. And that uh, example I showed you of SAXP, where we launch a single thread to do a single floating point multiply, is, uh, is exactly what I, what I mean. So there's a bunch of ways to, to expose that. OpenACC is one that we have, have worked on that uh, uses uh, pragmas to annotate your code, to, to give it hints as to where, where the parallelism, what is the safe, safe places to parallelize your code, and, and uh, you know, how to break some of the, the loop carried dependencies, such as the reduction in this loop. And the good news is if you do that, it's actually good for, for everybody. Um, uh, two examples from the Titan uh, work we did, S3D and uh, CAMSE, the, the climate code, both of them, as we ported the code to CUDA, we also, and exposed the parallelism for the GPU, we also saw an increase in the performance of the CPU version because it, the compiler was more able to find vectors. It was more uh, cache friendly. It was, it was a lot more uh, amenable to, uh, to, to those architectures as well. And so in, you know, we got a 50 to 100% performance improvement. And almost every time I show this slide, I say every third time I showed this slide, somebody says, oh yeah, I've seen that too. Uh, that where they've, they've uh, found performance improvements in their CPU version. So the question is, where are they going to go? Well, you know, we're, we're pushing quite hard to make GPUs more of a first-class parallel processor. I believe there already are. But as we integrate more features on the, on the device and more uh, functionality, and I, it, I think most of the work is going to be that software, you know, that preparing the the algorithms preparing the the architect the, the, um, the, the both the codes and the algorithms for that degree of parallelism. It's also happening in a in a sort of changing world. Right, the the world is uh, is not the same anymore. The dominance of 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 x86 based processors is uh, either slipping or gone, depending on how you read this graph, and. Um, you know, because of the, the cell phone revolution, it's really shifted a lot in the way that people think about architectures and think about, uh, about programs that run on them. And so NVIDIA is actually a, a company that, that works in, in both of those areas. So, so we um, uh, have at the very low end, we have the, the Tegra line that is uh, devices on the order of one watt, one to, one to three watts. And uh, you know, the GPUs take much, if not most, of the 8.2 megawatts in, uh, in Titan at the very uh, high end. So, you know, a device, so t creating an architecture that can ha tackle an installation from one watt to eight megawatts is actually quite a challenge. But the timing for this talk is actually great because last week at uh, SIGGRAPH, we showed off a preview of of uh, this thing, of Logan. Logan is um, the, the uh, processor, is our latest system on a chip in the Tegra family of, of, of processors. Tegra is, um, it goes in tablets and cell phones. If you have, a, anybody has a transformer prime, it's in those types of devices. If you have a an Audi or a Tesla car, not a Tesla processor, or a BMW, they also have Tegras in them. Um, and so Tegra 4 is, is the one that we're currently um, starting to ship. We have a game console that will ship today or tomorrow or something. Um, and, but the next generation of that that will be shipping early next year is called Logan. And Logan is the first one that, that 
that is fully uh, has a fully programmable GPU. It's it's CUDA capable. It's capable of all the latest. OpenGL, OpenGL 4.4, even though it's not released yet, it's, um, it's, it is exactly the same architecture that we used in the Titan supercomputer. There's no double precision units and there's no ECC, but that's okay. Um, the point is that, that the circuit work and the architecture work that, we, that drives us at that low end is also driving us at, at that high end. So Logan, um, we showed off last week it's, um, it uh, runs uh, at about uh, uh, one watt, uh, and uh, we have different uh, powers of it, power uh, versions of it, and uh, we'll continue to, to evolve that, that processor line. Um, the next one is called Parker, and the frequently asked question is, uh, is it named after me? And, uh, and uh, sometimes I say yes, but in reality, it's uh, it, this, these are all named after superheroes. So it's a Peter Parker is the. So power can so power is a, is a big deal. Um, we move to simpler cores, move to heterogeneous architectures, um, pay more attention to to where we move data, not only uh, within the the chip but within the machine room, and furthermore, HPC is also increasingly supported by consumer markets. Um, I. I think I pulled the slide, but there, I have a slide that shows a, a game conference with that's attended by 200,000 gamers, and you can see a sea of, of monitors, each one of which is uh, running a, a, a 10 teraflop uh, computation sustained for you know hours on a, on end. Right? This is th this is a market that, that's driving the need for high bandwidth, for high performance per watt, and for uh, in many cases some of the very same algorithms that that we use. Um, in, uh, in HPC. So uh, GPUs are evolving from the, the thing that you know, drew two lines from point A to point B to, to a first class parallel processor. And I think that was the key insight from Ian back in the, in the Brook days was that a graphics processor was really a parallel processor. And in fact, if you stuck a design team in a two design teams in a cave and told one of them to optimize for serial performance, they'd probably come up with a CPU. And the other team, you told them to optimize for parallel performance, they would come up with something that looks very much like a GPU in many ways. So to give you a, f a flavor of a few of the other programming things, we'll return to our favorite Saxby example. You saw that once before. There's really three ways to use a GPU to accelerate your application. Uh, libraries, there's a bunch of them, uh, the, some of which we make, some of which third parties make, there's open source libraries, and they're not, you know, this is, for example, Kublas, it takes the SAXP and it uh, makes it a little bit more verbose, but, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. There's also CUDA modes for, uh, for Python and other languages as well. OpenACC is the one I mentioned before, uh, by adding uh, pragmas, or directives to your code, you can tell it to uh, uh, parallelize certain loops. And it's, uh, the advantage is that it's, it's open, it's produced, it's, uh, they're compile open ACC compilers from Cray and PGI. And they're actually quite powerful. People have gotten actually a, a lot of uh, results out of taking their, their serial code and sprinkling in some, some directives and getting uh, quite credible results. In some cases, it's just as competitive. Uh, it's just the, sa it's the same performance, competitive in performance with the with a hand code CUDA code, but it uh, but it's not as it's not true for for everything yet. Uh, the openhcc.org is a place where you can find more. And then the th the third way to accelerate an application is with a programming language. And so this is what CUDA looks like. CUDA is the way to think of it is a uh, just a handful of extensions to C++. So we've added a few keywords that track where you put, um, uh, where you put pointers uh, to, to track multiple memory spaces and to expose uh, fine-grained parallelism. So fine-grained, that triple chevron bra uh, syntax is actually the only syntactic element we've added to, to C++ to make it CUDA. And then that global keyword um, is what marks that function as a, as a kernel. So this code you know, declares that kernel, copies some, uh, 
uh, memory to the device, uh, performs that SACSB and uh, copies it back. Um, there's similar, uh, there's CUDA Fortran is the, the logical equivalent for, uh, for Fortran as well. And then this is a slightly more complicated one that uh, uh, you know, is a, a Jacobi iteration uh, of a simple stencil. Um, <laughs> the very first version of it didn't do very well, and the, this is actually from a, from a tutorial that shows you how to, how to figure that out. Um, and so there's ways to figure out where all the time goes. And uh, then all you have to tell it is, well, let's copy that scratch, you know, declare that scratch array locally on the GPU that eliminates uh, moving data back and forth. So, and you do that by just adding one more pragma. And now it's, uh, it's uh, substantially faster than the, than the, uh, the parallelized uh, CPU code. So that, that's kind of a you know, quick overview of, of, of how, how OpenACC would work. Thank you.